Welcome to Asahwa's podcast, encouraging revival of the mind and the heart, seeing the truth and standing for what is right in the age of overloaded misinformation. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Peace be upon you all. Thank you very much for joining me for the second episode. Now, I hope you did enjoy the first episode. I hope you took the relevant information and if there were any corrections to be made, any feedback, like I said before, I am more than welcome. I'm more than happy for you to share it with me and I would love to be corrected in anything that I have said wrong, including my pronunciation of Hebrew names and words, which we're going to kind of go through again. Just to kind of recap, we've determined already now, there was no area, no land, no country, no dynasty for around just under 2000, 2000 years. Let's just say 1900 years, 1900 years, there was no area that was ruled, governed by a Jewish government, Jewish people in the region, anywhere really in the world, <laughs> but in the region of what is Palestine, Israel today. And we mentioned last time in order to comprehend and understand and appreciate what is going on today in Palestine and Israel, we need to go right back, historically speaking, dig out the facts from history, understand them, digest them, and then move on. So today, we are going to speak about, very briefly, because remember, these sessions aren't there to be such long sessions, because you're not going to ha have the capability to digest everything that I am trying to pass forward to you guys from the little research that I have done. And I say little because it's massive. The, the events that have taken place uh, in history, the amount to read, the amount of research is humongous. So I'm literally speaking, going through this as if it's like kind of bullet points. And you might say, well, you're biased because you seem you are pro-Palestinian. Maybe, but still, I am trying to be fair and clear in terms of facts. Towards the end of the 1800s, coming towards the 1900s, oh, well, we can even go back further a little bit um, and kind of just remind the world, really, what the situation was, politically speaking, how the European Western colonialists of going into Africa, going into various islands in the Atlantic Ocean, the Pacific Ocean, uh, in, in the Far East as Indonesia and Malaysia, you know, how do you find Spanish-speaking, Portuguese-speaking people in around kind of India, right, around Goa and these places? How do you find, you know, Christians... Uh, in Goa, how is it that you find Portuguese names and languages spoken in Indonesia? How is it that you can speak in, uh, in Portuguese in countries such as Angola, um, Somalia? Why do they eat pasta and spaghetti? <clears throat> By this time, the European colonialists went absolutely berserk and crazy. They thought they had the right to take whatever land they wanted. So they spilled into Africa. They tore Africa apart. They, they ripped India apart and stole all their riches. They stole all their diamonds, their gold and what have you. So while this craziness was going on, you had in 1914 the start of the First World War. Now, with this, this led the European, European colonialists to begin to fight over land, okay, and 
Um, then you had the emergence of the United Nations, uh, United Agents, <laughs> well, you might as well call them that, the United Nations, which uh, I think originally was really um, the League of Christians or the Christian League. Now, um, you know, let's face it. I mean, who was a part of the United Nations during that time and era were most of the colonial superpowers. And as they were fighting over the land, you had the British mandate, as we mentioned um, before as well, uh, of the area called Palestine. Under the British mandate, it was called British Palestine. Visas were issued to whoever was coming into the country, into the land, into the region of Palestine, and we, I mean, I've seen it in my research, uh, copies of the old visas, it clearly stated British Palestine. We've seen that. I mean, it's it's evident enough to say that Palestine has existed long enough. I'm just trying to give you context of the situation, a very brief situation of what was going on around the world at that, at that point. Like I said, 1914, the First World War, came to an end in 1919, you had the British Mandate in 1917, uh, or oh, sorry, a bit before that. And by that time, there was chaos in the world. Chaos in the Arab world, the Muslim world, in India. Countries were being formed, countries were being divided. There was, um, you know, forced allegiances from countries and people. There was situations where uh, the end of the Ottoman Empire around 1919, but officially in 1924, allegiances were bought, allegiances were forced. You had many people, Muslims, Hindus and Sikhs from the Indian subcontinent fighting for the British Raj. Uh, yet again, you had a lot of Central Asian countries that was fighting for the Soviet Union that was fighting for, uh, <laughs> later on, Nazi Germany. Uh, North Africans, you had uh, them divided. They were fighting uh, for the Western Allies, and as many of them, they were also fighting for Germany as well. So the world was in chaos at this point. Now, how is it that this concept, this idea of Zionism came about? In my little research, and I'll emphasize in my little research, this idea was actually, some say, that came from Napoleon around the 17th century when he uh, conquered Egypt. And there was an idea of Jews having a homeland. And some of the articles and research that I've read actually states that uh, it was Napoleon who came up with this idea regarding Palestine being the home for the Jews. Now, 17th century, it was under the Ottoman rule. So you, you kind of beg the question to why would Napoleon make such a statement and supporting a Jewish homeland in Palestine in the 17th century? Some state the fact that it would have been very pivotal for France as a superpower in Europe because being in the area of Palace, what is Palestine today, you've got access obviously to sea, the to Cyprus, to Turkey, etc. So you've got your enemy kind of just across the sea, i.e. the Ottoman Empire. And then you also have access to Africa, straight into Egypt. You have access to uh, you know, Syria, Jordan, what is today Jordan, Lebanon, etc. So it was an idea that came about but was kind of quashed. There is research to suggest as well that there was uh, an idea for a united front for the Jewish people. As we mentioned before, the way the Jews were treated and pushed out of that region, that area, by various uh, dynasties such as the Romans, but they did have asylum and safety under the Muslim rule in Spain, under the Muslim rule in uh, in the Ottoman Empire. And there was a significant Jewish community in the region. However, majority, as we have stated, left 
and it was this idea of putting them in an area where they would be united and some say from the very time that they were driven out of the region they had been given a god-given right to this land and wanted to return and they were a people that were lost without their land theodore herzl was an Austrian-Hungarian Jewish journalist and a political activist who is dubbed and known as the father of modern political Zionism. It's quite interesting. Modern political Zionism. So there are many kind of histor historical scholars that state that Zionism is not just political, it is religious as well, but I've not really seen much of that. I've only seen kind of the political side of Zionism. Anyhow... So he forms this Zionist organization and promoted it amongst the Jewish people around the world um, in his pamphlets, newspapers, etc. And his idea was for a mass Jewish immigration to eventually to Palestine to form a Jewish state. In 1896, he published a pamphlet. I hope it's, if, it's, if I say it correctly, Judenstadt, which is... Um, uh, German, in which he elaborated his visions of a Jewish homeland. Now, obviously, he attracted uh, international attention from many influential people, Jewish people, uh, from professors to bankers to political activists to people in, in armies in around the world in different countries. Now, he grew as a major figure in the Jewish world. Herzl writes in Judenstadt, The Jewish question persists wherever Jews live, in appreciable numbers. Wherever it does not exist, it is brought in together with Jewish immigrants. We are naturally drawn into those places where we are not persecuted, and our appearance there gives rise to persecution. This is the case and will inevitably be so. Everywhere, even in highly civilized countries, see for instance France, so, lo so long as the Jewish question is not solved on the political level. Now, he makes a case of what you will call today anti-Semitism. And just to make it clear again to everyone, or as a reminder, when it comes to anti-Semitism, we are talking about who is a Simite, are those, generally speaking, who actually speak languages like Hebrew, Aramaic, Arabic. So if you are showing hate towards an Arab, you are anti-Semitic. It's not just for Jews. Anyhow, in this context, we're talking about anti-Semitism was on a high towards the, uh, before the First World War, uh, during the late 1800s. And people were be being victimized because of their identity. And to, to be fair, Theodore Herzl had come across a lot of anti-Semitism towards him because he was Jewish, etc. And this idea was embedded in him. Now, in 1897, he convened a first Jewish Congress in Switzerland and he was elected president of the Zionist organization. So this is where he began his series of diplomatic initiatives to build up this idea and to build the support, should I really say, for a Jewish state. He went to the emperor of Germany, William II, and Ottoman Sultan Abdul Hamid II, rahimahullah. And he didn't get anywhere with them because there was no way for them to pursue or assist in this dream that Herzl had. Now, um, it would be safe to kind of say he continued doing a lot of his work, his political work, his activism you know, trying to drum up support for his idea. And he had a lot of backing, a lot of backing. And really and truly with any kind of movement, any kind of 
belonging to a home, looking around and doing this kind of work, you know, it takes years, it takes years for anyone to kind of get anywhere. Um, anyhow, uh, Herzl died in 1904. Uh, there was a lot of issues, um, even with his family. There was things of his, uh, I think it was his daughter, his son, they, you know, died of drug overdose. Um, one got drunk and, and uh, fell, you know, I think fell off a, a balcony or something. Anyway, um, it wasn't a very good ending for his children and what have you. Uh, that's just a side note. Um but his idea continued. It was, you know, the Zionist organization had been formed. It was in full flow. They were around the world trying to find this way of getting into Palestine. So you have an area, Palestine, which is majority Arabs. There are Jews there. There are Christians there. The Holy Land, the Al-Aqsa Mosque, the various Christian places of worship the various Jewish places of worship, all have been protected under Islamic rule. And by this time now, the majority of people living in the area called Palestine is, was Arab. Majority were Arab. Okay, And if you were not Arab and you were living there, you will end up speaking the Arabic language. So majority, 99% or even 100% really, were Arabic speaking, uh, you know, what, whatever country you came from. Now, 1904, Herzl passed away, interesting name, uh, Theodore, not very really Jewish, but anyway, um, just, to, just to make that point. And the reason why I'm saying that is, again, ethnically, the Jews that are present in, in the area of Israel, Palestine today, are not from Palestine or from Israel, ethnically, a lot of the Jewish community came from Europe, as we have already established, 250,000 from Germany, and then, you know, the other amount, large amount from Poland, and Austria, Hungary, Romania, uh, Yemen, Iraq, etc. Uh, anyway, that's just a side note. So, uh, going on, they continue looking for uh, this dream of populating and taking over the area of Palestine because it was their biblical right. So we have an extract from from Belfour to Rothschild. Now interestingly, just remember the name, remember the name Rothschild because Rothschild are linked to the banking dynasty which goes back generations and still are about so you had this original letter which states his majesty's government view with favor the establishment in palestine of a national home for the jewish people and will use their best endeavors to facilitate the achievement of this objective it being clearly understood that nothing shall be done which may prejudice the civil and religious rights of existing non-Jewish communities in Palestine or the rights and political status enjoyed by Jews in any other country. So let's just put some context to this. Really and truly, by the time the British mandate was given by the United Nations and what have you, and you found that Britain was in control, taking control of the area of Palestine, and they called it Palestine, and it was British Palestine and what have you. What you saw here was the letter from Balfour clearly stating that the British government has, the, has given the go-ahead for this idea of a national home for the Jewish people. However, they do mention being clearly understood that nothing shall be done with which may prejudice the civil and religious rights of the existing non-Jewish communities in Palestine or the rights and the political status enjoyed by Jews in any other country. So it was quite clear that you're going to come to Palestine, not that I agree with it, and I don't think anybody else would really agree with it, 
you, the Jewish community, are not there. You are not in relevant numbers. But now you are becoming coming in to the area of Palestine in those relevant numbers. Interestingly, a historian by the name of Avi Shalem, which I think is Jew, a Jewish name, he, he states, Britain had no moral or political or legal right to promise the land that belongs to the Arabs to another people. <laughs> right? I mean, that is absolutely clear. I mean, who the hell does the United Nations think they are? And who does Britain think they are that they can decide one day, oh, it's under our rule, we are governing it. Well, you know what, Jewish community, you can have it, no problem. Because we've already promised the Arabs that now there is no more Ottoman Empire and you are no longer under the Ottoman rule, we will award you the land. Now, it sounds something very familiar to what the British did later on, 1947, in British India, where the land was divided, which was supposed to be majority Hindu, majority Muslim. You had what they called East Pakistan and West Pakistan. Present-day Bangladesh and present-day Pakistan. You've got two separate countries with, well, so two separate entities, supposed to be one country, i.e. East Pakistan, West Pakistan, and then you had India smack right in the middle. I mean, how is a country supposed to operate? It just doesn't make sense. And then we saw the ugly side of it, the wars that happen, Kashmir is still a, a situation where it was promised to Pakistan, it was promised to India, and then we saw it was it's still divided and there's still chaos going on. Same sort of thing that we can see happen in Palestine where the British promised the Arabs that this will be your independent home and then promised the Jews that you will have a home here, but you cannot be prejudiced against the people in their religious or their political rights and we can see the situation right now anyhow with the influx of the jewish community the jews coming from all over from europe also coming from yemen also coming from iraq and these kind of places iran they're all coming in to if we go back a little bit and say under the Ottoman rule, they came for uh, asylum and safety and it was given to them then during the time of the British. But obviously there was objection from the Arab countries, the newly born Arab countries such as Transjordan, etc. And uh, from the Arab population, the Arab leaders and the chiefs, etc. They were alarmed they were alarmed at the rate of Jews coming into Palestine. Hence the reason why they objective, they objected against the amount that were coming in. And Britain tried their best to restrict further Jewish migration. Now, just imagine, you live in an area where it's just been yourselves, your community, your language, your religion, etc., there are other minorities also living in the same sort of area. There hasn't been any major tensions. Then suddenly, within days, weeks, months and years, a major increase of a particular people coming into the country without your control. Remember, this is your country, but this is without your control now. Britain are allowing hundreds and hundreds and thousands and thousands of Jews from all around the world to come to this area. The chiefs, the leaders of the Arabs are concerned. There is, now I'm going to be fair, there is no doubt that there were attacks by uh, Arab militias, Arab groups uh, against the uh, Jews in the area. Now, in the right frame of mind, obviously, if something like this is happening, you are going to defend yourself. Now, remember this, please, ladies and gentlemen. Remember what I'm saying. You are feel you are being threatened. You are being killed. You are being persecuted. You are going to defend yourself, and rightly so. Hence, you had a new phase and a new face of Zionism. 
this idea of a Jewish homeland has to be taking place no matter what the cost. The migration of Jews was going to continue and they weren't going to allow anyone to stop it, not even the British. You had a paramilitary organization that was called Haganah. Now, the strange enough, right, they operated initially to defend the Orthodox Jewish communities in Palestine because they were being, uh, you know, attacked uh, by Arab militias and, and what have you. Tension is obviously going to be there. There's no doubt about that. And like I said, I'm being honest and fair. This is what happened. And groups like this came about. Now, Haganah, apparently in Hebrew, means defense. So they came about and was founded around 1920. And believe it or not, we are going to mention a bit more about this, but they were disbanded in 1948 when the state of Israel was created and became the core force integrated into the present day IDF, Israel Defense Force. So just imagine a terrorist Paramilitary, paramilitary organization that existed prior to 1948 now becomes the Israeli Defense Force. So just keep this in your mind. You had many other organizations such as the Ergun or, or Irgun, if that's how you pronounce it. And this was a Jewish underground organization. This was founded in 1931 by a group of Haganah commanders who left Haganah uh, you know, they were upset, there was infighting, they were upset about the charter, the defense charter, and um, they formed their own organization. Now, what you're going to find is something quite surprising, because you never hear about it. <clears throat> it's quite um, uh, shocking now, looking back into history, thinking to yourselves, is this even possible? Because nowadays, when you read history, you are told about the various terrorist organizations such as the IRA, the ANC, before it's become a political party, was known as a terrorist organization, right? And uh, any and, and many Muslim organizations that came about. So now you're talking about the 1940s before 1948. These paramilitary organizations, Jewish ones, came about. And there was many Jewish militants they began to attack the British government facilities because of the fact that the British by this time had put a, not a complete stop, but reduced the numbers of Jewish migration, right? And strange enough, these Jewish militants, terrorists, began an operation targeting, targeting the British government in Jerusalem, in Tel Aviv, in Jaffa, uh, during 1945, and it resulted in around, they say, a, a few deaths of British government personnel. Further to this, Jewish militants killed seven British government soldiers near Tel Aviv on April 25th, 1946. One of the famous incidents that occurred was at the King David Hotel. This was the headquarters, in a sense, of the British Military Command and the British Criminal Investigation Division, i.e. the CID. Now, what happened was, the Brit British military and the CID, they, or the British troops, they actually um, invaded uh, the uh, Ergun, Ergun, if that's how you pronounce it, the Jewish agency, let's call it, in, in 1946, in June. But as the British entered, they confiscated large quantities of documents, right? And because of that, around 2,500 Jews from all over Palestine were placed under arrest because of this information. And lots, lots of information regarding Jewish um, paramilitary operations, including intelligence of activities in Arab countries. Now, all this information, all this paperwork was taken to King 
David Hotel. And surprise, surprise, what happened? It was targeted by the Jewish terrorists. Recently declassified MI16 or MI6 sorry, documents show how Zionist groups fighting for the creation of the Israeli state was emboldened to commit acts of terrorism against the British. To commit acts of terrorism against the British, both in Palestine and in Britain. <laughs> right? You're talking about 1946 now, yeah? According to the Haaretz, which is the Israeli newspaper, the Jewish newspaper, in July 1946, one of these groups named Ergun blew up the British administration headquarters in Palestine, resulting in many civilian deaths. Another of these groups, the Lehi, or the Stern Gang, carried out similar bombings and assassinations in Britain. So these Jewish Zionist organizations not only committed acts of terror in Palestine, targeting the British troops, the hanging of British troops, the killing and targeting of British government personnel, they also came to Britain and targeted certain high-ranking military and political figures in Britain. There was an article in the Times newspaper of 1946 which stated there was a series of post-box bombings and they attributed this to these Jewish Zionist terrorist organizations in the 1940s. Now, I would say to you, which is a, a strange thing, if you go onto a lot of the Jewish websites and you read about the history, like I said, I'm trying to be fair as possible, they will class them as the Jewish defense groups or Jewish defense organizations. Even though they committed acts of terrorism, they were still seen as a defense force. Kind of what you hear about things like other organizations, resistance organizations, hint, hint. I hope you kind of understand what I'm trying to say. Anyhow, Going back to these gangs, there was a Stern, the Stern Gang, as we mentioned already, was a Zionist extremist organization in Palestine, founded in 1940, um, and it, you know, split with another right-wing uh, organization, you know, as a movement. Now, these kind of acts continued to happen in the 40s, right up until 1948, when the State of Israel was created. The question to ask, what happened to many of these organizations? And surprisingly, most of these organizations, most of them stopped doing their work, their defense, uh, their acts of uh, killing and bombing and acts of terrorism uh, by 1948 when the State of Israel was formed. If you look at the organization, like the Ergun, Ergun it, it basically became a political party called Herut. You had the other organization called Lihi, which became the Moldit Party, which today continues to openly advocate the ethnic cleansing of Palestinians from the West Bank and Gaza, these territories which are now occupied by Israel. I tell you, the most strangest thing, absurdly, the terrorist leader of the Ergun organization, Begin, he became the Israeli Prime Minister and he received the Nobel Peace Prize winner. That's just, it just doesn't make sense. How is this possible after his history and what he done and how Israel continued doing their part in ethnically cleansing the area of Palestine. You had another leader of another organization called Yitzhak Shamir, and he also became one of the prime ministers of Israel. 
Now, these groups continue to form the part in the political in part of the political establishment in the in, in, in Israel. During the chaos, in even after nineteen forty eight, there's obviously there was still a lot of issues, a lot of problems, a lot of confrontation, uh, a lot of rioting, a lot you know, the, it was chaotic. The UN appointed a, a Swedish diplomat by the name of Bernard as a mediator to Palestine, and he was assassinated in September 1948 by one of these organizations, and probably wouldn't be organizations such as Ergun or the Maldib, uh, the, Le- the Lehi, because obviously they became political parties, but there were still fractions of other paramilitary terrorist Jewish organizations that was out there, because they were still doing their acts of terror on ethnic minorities or the people like the Arabs, for example. In 1949, you had 700,000 Palestinians who were forced to leave their homes in Palestine and were refused entry, even up to now. 700,000 Palestinians became refugees. Over 13,000 Palestinians were killed by the Israeli military because by now, 1949, they've been recognized and they were recognized by the United States and the Soviet Union at that time. They recognized them as a state, but many other countries did not. You remember the famous intelligence service called Mossad. They came about in 1949, but really around the 51, 52, they were in full operation. Now, strange enough, again, their spying was found in Baghdad, in Iraq. It was exposed, and the, all the intelligence officers were arrested. I believe they were executed. I might be wrong here, but anyway, they were all arrested. Now, this is Mossad operating in other countries. Okay, you might ask the question, what is Mossad doing operating in Arab countries and for what reason? One of the accusations is there were a number of synagogues and Jewish places where the Jew, Jewish community used to meet, I suppose, kind of like community centers. They were targeted by Arabs. That is true. Uh, a few Arabs did throw grenades, etc., and a few Jews did die. Now, these are Iraqi Jews. These are Arab-speaking Jews. But what you found was clear evidence of Mossad agents actually bombing synagogues themselves. And you're going to ask the question, why would that occur? And we're going we're gonna to ex- explain it in a bit. Now, one of the most famous... Mossad agents was Eli Kohan, an Egyptian-born Jew. Now, this guy infiltrated the high ranks of the Syrian government. He was posing as a Syrian businessman before he was discovered, and he was executed in 1965. Now, what I will say to you is this is nothing new. These accusations have been going around. And it has also been proven that organizations like Mossad have conducted in bombings and killings of their own people, Jewish people, in order to frighten them, to have a major exodus of Jews to go to the only place of safety, which would be Israel, present-day Israel. We know how the war that occurred in 1967, Egypt, Jordan, and other countries, etc., you know, decided to go to war with Israel, etc. Now, listen to this. On the eve of the attack in 1967, the Israeli minister, Yigal Alon, he wrote, In a new war, we must avoid the historic mistake of the War of Independence, 1948. And must not cease fighting until we achieve total victory, the territorial fulfillment of the land of Israel. So it's clear 
that there was never an idea of a two-state solution and that the Arabs were going to be able to live there in peace and harmony. Now, going back to uh, Mossad, they conducted undercover operations, as we mentioned, and those operations were against who they deemed to be enemies of Israel, uh, even finding former Nazi criminals and, and exposing them and killing them. Uh, Mossad agents also tracked down the, uh, uh, the 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 guys that assassinated the um, or, or killed the uh, Israeli athletes in 1972 in the Munich Olympic Games. Uh, they tracked down the uh, leader and assassinated him. They also assassinated and killed several Palestinian leaders living in Europe, the Middle East, and North Africa. They were known for this right so it's like they had impunity nobody could say what they did was wrong no one could take them to justice because this is the persona that they built amongst themselves right that they couldn't be touched and like i said to you 1950 to 51 mossad was accused of bombing jewish synagogues uh, in iraq especially so he can force them to leave Iraq and go towards Palestine because of the numbers that they needed. So in this episode, my point was really to show the face of Zionism and how Zionism forced its idea of a Zionist state, forcing the United Nations and forcing Britain to give up the land of Palestine and forcing uh, the Arabs to retreat and take in the area or the region of Palestine. And if you go and do your own research and look at 1946, how majority, 90% in 1946 was still Palestinian land, then there was a UN plan in 1947 to divide Palestine and Israel. And if you look at the area of what it was supposed to be and what it is now, there is an absolute massive difference. 1967, before the war broke out or just after the war, there was a agreement of what was going to be Palestine and what was going to be Israel. Coming to 2023, if you look at those maps, which clearly states that Palestine is, is in fragments, a majority is Israel, because they are allowing the occupation of the 1967 borders, which really didn't exist anyway, and they encourage the settlers coming in, the Jewish settlers coming in, as if it's their right to take the occupied lands even more. So what will come and what will become of Palestine in another 30 to 40 years? The dream, the dream that the Zionist organization was holding from before. Finally, I would like to quote from the book, The Struggle for World Power by George, by George Cookfer. He mentions... In the years of the Balfour Declaration, Dr. Nohum Goldman, president of the World Jewish Congregation, explained the Jews might have had Uganda, Madagascar, and other places for the establishment of the Jewish fatherland, but they want absolutely nothing except Palestine. Not because the Dead Sea water by evaporation can produce $5 trillion worth of metalloids and powdered metal. Not because the subsoil of Palestine contains 20 times more petroleum than all the combined reserves of the two Americas, but because Palestine is the crossroads of Europe, Asia, and Africa, because Palestine constitutes the veritable center of the world political power, the strategic center for world control. In 1920, Dr. James Wiseman, first president of Israel in 1948-52, he said in 1920, 
we will establish ourselves in Palestine whether you like it or not. You can hasten our, our arrival or you can equally retard it. It is, however, better for you to help us so as to avoid our constructive power being turned into a destructive power which will overthrow the world. Now, that sounds like a serious, serious statement. It sounds like, it sounds like they're ready for a fight. It sounds like Zionism here clearly is about a political strategical move by certain Jewish people who want to be in control, possibly. So watch out for the next episode as we will dis be discussing about the Arab resistance and the shape and the form it's taken and to what has it become today. So I hope you've learned something from this episode and as usual i'd be grateful for your corrections suggestions your feedback as well so stay safe speak to you next time see you next time let's learn let's teach let's talk and let's engage god bless assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh